Welcome to The Next Track, a podcast about how people listen to music today. I'm Doug Adams. And I'm Kirk McElhern. Hello, good day, and thanks for giving us a listen today. You know, if you listen regularly and you like the show, we hope you'll let the person sitting next to you share your earphones. No, no, that wouldn't be a good idea. That would turn out badly. Tell you what, just turn to the person sitting next to you right now and say, I'm listening to the Next Track podcast. You should too. That'd be the safer way to go, and that'd be a good thing to do. This is episode number 87 of the Next Track. It's been a while since we've had him on the show, and so we're happy to welcome back our good friend Andy Doe. Andy, it's great to see you. It's great to be back on the show on this uh, chilly new year. I was involved in a discussion on Facebook recently, and we were talking about music and instruments and the pitch of instruments, the the way the instruments play specific notes, the frequency at which an instrument plays specific notes. That's the pitch. And in the discussion, we were saying, well, if you're playing an instrument on its own, the pitch itself doesn't matter as long as it's in tune. So you could tune your guitar to any pitch you want. And as long as the strings are in tune appropriately from one to the other, you can play your guitar music. If you have a flute and it's tuned, say, a semitone high or a semitone low, it really doesn't matter that much if you're just playing alone. But once you start playing with other musicians, then you get the problem that all instruments need to have the same pitch. And that got me wondering. I know that in Baroque music, for example, the pitch is usually a semitone lower than what we use now, and sometimes it can even be a full tone lower. And I know that in some cases, pitch can be even higher. And it made me wonder how pitch has been determined and normalized and standardized and how all this works. Who better than Andy to give us an explanation of the historical nature of pitch? Well, this is a fun one. And it all begins many hundreds of years ago when people did not get about much. As you say, if you wanted to play with another flute player, another lute player, then you had to tune your instrument to theirs. And on a string instrument, you have a fairly wide band within which you can tune your instrument up and down. On a uh, on a wind instrument, it's it's a little less. But as time went by, musicians started to travel around more and more, and they would take their idea of pitch with them. And so, well, once upon a time, it, it didn't really matter what the definition of an A was. Over time, musicians wanted to move around more. They would take their idea of an A with them, and the number of... of pitches in use began to coalesce around a a kind of a norm that's relatively close to the the modern modern pitch that we play at today so you mentioned the a and when we talk about pitch today we always talk about a equals something The, the standard western pitch is a equals 440 which means that an a note is 440 hertz a specific a note an a note an octave up would be 880 an a note an octave down would be 220 etc how did musicians decide that a would be the reference point. Well, you could make any note within the octave the reference point, but A is the beginning of the alphabet, and that's the one that we traditionally define. And so, when you're when you buy a tuning fork, normally it's an A. Sometimes tuning forks are a C. It's the kind of second most common note for a tuning fork to be. But from one note, you can figure out what all the others are. You usually, only use the tuning fork to figure out the first note in your scale. And so either an A or a C is is what's defined. So if the A won out because it's the first letter of the alphabet, that means that it won out because of countries that use the A, B, C, D, E, F, G system for notes, and not every country does that. Right, but in fact, tuning forks were not very commonly used until until the 19th century. That people People had tuning forks, earlier than this, but there wasn't a widespread use of of tuning forks to fix a single pitch until until relatively late in the development of what we think of as the, the classical repertoire. So what did they use originally? When when Bach walked three days or, or 30 days to see Buxtehude and learn from him about the organ, they presumably were playing with different pitches. How would they have had the reference to compare the pitch that they used? Well, so Bach did have tuning forks, and uh, it's Bach's tuning forks that are one of the reference points for the common modern adoption of 415 hertz as as Baroque pitch. 
What's interesting about this is that, well, in uh, Bach's tuning fork might have been at 415 hertz, A equals 415, uh, which is roughly equivalent to a semitone below uh, the modern pitch. So a, a modern A flat is about a Bach A. These days, early music specialists travel around a lot. They all have to be able to play with each other. And so we, we have a, a modern fixed Baroque pitch in the Baroque period. There wasn't such a fixed idea of pitch and tuning forks from Bach's lifetime range from uh, 390 hertz up to up to 475. So there, there was a pretty a pretty wide a pretty wide range. Kirk mentioned organs, and you say that pitch didn't travel well from place to place. And so I'm wondering when organs were constructed in different locations by different organ builders. How did they tune? I mean, uh, was it that an organ in one city would be tuned differently to another organ in another city? Absolutely. And the great thing about organs is that they're not very portable. So nobody was ever going to find out that your organ was, was higher or lower than one in, a, in another town. And the, the thing about an, an organ is that the way you tune it is by adjusting the lengths of the pipes. And over time, and some of these organs would be tuned many times over over hundreds of years, the pipes would often end up getting shorter because you'd you'd hammer on the flap that makes the pitch rise and then you'd hammer it back down again, you'd hammer it up a bit and eventually bits would snap off. And the only way to sort out all these bent, mangled old pipes was to cut a bit off all of them in the process, raising the pitch of the organ slightly. And this was, this was a fairly commonplace bit of organ maintenance. It's the major service on the organ. And so the pitch of organs would would rise over time it was just just one of a number of upwards pressures on on pitch over time uh the the other being uh something that i think doug as a as a dj you'll have experienced that uh has been very common during particularly the the vinyl era for radio stations in in the 20th century to pitch up records playing all of the records slightly faster than either the, the, the specified uh, RPM of, of the record or faster than the other radio stations locally. And what this does is it makes the record sound a little bit more exciting and uh, it doesn't just run faster, it runs at a higher pitch and and you, you get much more energy into it. And it, it makes your radio station sound more exciting than your neighboring radio stations. Yeah, if you're an astute radio listener, you can figure out if the radio station you're listening to is pitching stuff up. We used to do it all the time. Uh, I used to work at a top 40 station that did it. And a lot of people think that it's to speed up the music so they could play more music. But it's actually, as you say, to add a little sparkle to the music. I had a music director who actually duct taped the uh, pitch controllers of the turntables to make sure that we didn't mess with them. And he'd we pushed them up probably about almost as much as half a semitone. Yeah, and that, that's quite a bit higher and faster. If you if you push it much further than that, everything starts to sound really, really chipmunky. But but this was this was done by radio stations. It was also done by orchestras, and so there was this this general trend for pitches to to rise upwards, and so you start to see pitch being really standardized around the beginning of the. Uh, beginning of the 19th century, and then still continue to creep upwards as people try to draw a line in the sand. Okay, okay, we'll all agree. We'll play at 435. Someone's going, all right, they're all playing 435. Okay, well, we'll play at 437. <laughs> we'll play at 438. And, and you, still, you still have this, this now. Like 440 was really the last serious line in the sand on, on pitch inflation. And that's been agreed for... Over a hundred years now, um, it's been in use. Uh, 440 really did emerge almost 200 years ago. It's been pretty widely agreed as a standard for over a century. And still, you look at big orchestras in Europe, they're quite often 441, 442, a little bit of 443 maybe if they're feeling saucy. And <laughs> and it, this, gives them, this gives them just that, that, that little bit little bit more fizzle, they think. But why is that? I know we've spoken in the past about how if you're comparing two audio devices, the one that is a little bit louder is going to sound better because the volume, we just have this instinctive 
feeling that the louder volume sounds better. Why would a higher pitch sound better? Oh, so this is this is an interesting one. Um, on string instruments, uh, to get the higher pitch, you have to tighten the strings more. And this means that you can put more energy into bowing or plucking that, that string. With wind instruments, frequently, um, again, they will project better in their upper registers. And so tuning everything up a little bit gets a better projected sound out of out of some wind instruments as well you do sometimes run into a, a wall here where you tune it up so high the instrument no longer really plays in tune with itself but generally speaking tuning up a little bit will allow you to get a, a little bit more energy out of the instrument can you change the pitch on a wind instrument i thought a flute was had, had holes that were drilled in certain places and that that was unchangeable. Right. So all of the holes in the flute are drilled in set places, but you can slide the mouthpiece in and out a little bit to adjust the distance between that mouthpiece and the first hole. That doesn't change the distance between all of the subsequent holes. So that's why you said the instrument might no longer be in tune with itself? Exactly. And on a brass instrument, usually you can adjust the length of not just the total length of tubing, but also the little lengths of tubing that are added when you press a valve down. And that gives you a bit more flexibility. But with a, with some of the woodwind instruments, they're, they're a little bit more sensitive to this. And so you the player will have to compensate for this by, by bending the note to either side of the instrument's natural resonant frequency. So string instruments are interesting. If you tune it higher... The strings are more taut and you can play them in a different way. If you tune them lower, they're more slack. But there still seems to be a sort of a midpoint with a string instrument, let's say a cello or a violin, that you can't go too much higher or too much lower. I remember a recording by Peter Wispelway a couple years ago of Bach's cello suites, and he recorded it at A is 392. So that's almost a full tone below A is 440. And it sounded very loose because the strings weren't tight. And... I, I can understand that you want that lower resonance, but you don't get as much flexibility in the way you play. H how much latitude do you have on a string instrument? About a tone or so? That's that's close to the limit. Um, with uh, with the low strings on a cello or a bass, if you tune them down much lower than that, then there won't be enough tension in the string to respond to the movement of the bow, and you'll have to you'll have to pluck the string as you begin to bow it to start it to start it moving and that's an effect that is sometimes called for sometimes used but generally speaking it it will it will hamper the operation of the instrument it will hamper its projection uh, that said there is another advantage to tuning the strings down um, orchestras in cuba tend to play at a slightly lower pitch than 440 and the reason that they do this is that uh, because of trade embargoes, Cuba is a place where it's very difficult to obtain replacement strings for string instruments. And the strings will last longer if you keep them at a at a lower pitch. So the standard has emerged there for orchestras to play at, at a slightly lower pitch to make their strings last longer. Could this be a reason why some Baroque and early music performers play at lower pitches as well? Because I, I played viola de gamba for a year, and I didn't break any of the gut strings on it, but they're very expensive to replace. Right, and of course they're made out of a different material to the strings on. Well, they're on made a, out of sheep gut. Yes, whereas on a modern instrument where you'd be playing at a higher pitch, they tend to be made out of steel, which is obviously much, much stronger. But certainly the material from which the, the strings are made it contributes to the, uh, the suitability of a lower pitch. So we've more or less established that 440 is the standard pitch. Let's go from pitch to tuning. The difference between pitch and tuning is that the pitch establishes a bass frequency of a single note, and every other note is tuned to that. But there are all sorts of tuning systems. Tuning is also called temperament. How does this work, and, and when did we settle on the temperament that we use now, which, to, to be honest, isn't ideal? Certain keys sound good and certain keys don't sound good. Okay, so the way this works is that there's there's a couple of different ways of, of cutting up an octave so that the notes within it will sound nice and, and natural. An octave is defined by a, a doubling of pitch. So um, if 1A is 440, the A below it will be 220 and the A above it will be 880. But the way you spread out the other notes 
within that octave depends upon the music that you're planning to play and and the way you want that to sound. So the modern system of equal temperament makes all of the keys on the piano sound essentially the same. It divides the scale of 12 notes up into equal steps and every one of them should sound about the same. But another way of defining the notes within an octave is to look at the intervals within that octave. So uh, a completely a completely pure perfect fifth, the interval between a C and a G, can be defined by the ratio of two to three. That the for every two vibrations that the C string does, the G string will vibrate three times. So if we're tuned to A equals four forty, a fifth up from A is E, and that means that the E should be six hundred sixty hertz, correct? Yes. 440 divided by 2 multiplied by 3? Yeah, so you get 660. But if you keep on going up a fifth from E to a B and you keep going all the way up until you get to A again, the A that you get to is not an octave or 2 or 3 or 10 octaves above 440. You can't get back to the same note. So either your fifths are all perfectly in tune or your octaves are perfectly in tune. Is this Pythagoras' fault? Well, so tuning all of the fifths so that they're perfect is called Pythagorean tuning, and uh, you get lovely fifths, but the octaves are wonky. The bit that's missing to close the octave is called a Pythagorean comma, and this leads to all sorts of strange sounds as you work through different keys. So... Instead, various different types of temperament were come up with, ways of tempering or adjusting the intervals so that you wouldn't have all of the wrongness all in, all in one place. You wouldn't have a whole comma missing anywhere in, the, anywhere in the scale. So the Pythagorean system is one thing, and I've read about the mean tone system, which goes back to polyphonic music. Is that correct? That's right. So the mean tone system really became popular during the Renaissance and what you do when you're tuning a keyboard instrument to uh, a mean tone tempered scale is you still work around the cycle of fifths, but each fifth is out by about the same amount. And so the comma doesn't end up all bunched together in, in one place. There's no comma inflation as you go on. <laughs> That's right. So you don't, you don't get steadily further out as you, uh, as you work your way around the keyboard. Uh, what this means, depending on how you do it, is that either the major thirds or the minor thirds in your key will be perfectly in tune and you'll get your 3 to 2 and your uh, 3 to 4 ratios just right. But there will always be some intervals that sound particularly weird because what, what you've done in tuning it this way is you've hidden the bad intervals in uncommonly used places, which is fine if you're playing the instrument entirely in one key with not very many not very much modulation you if you're not going to need the uh the the b natural then it, it doesn't matter that it's going to sound wonky next to the f sharp so is this why it's much more common for people to compose music in certain keys a and g and d and c minor rather than f sharp major and b flat minor it's one of the reasons why it was more common to do it that way there are also technical reasons on, on instruments that favor certain keys. So um, it may be very, very awkward to play the F sharp major scale on an instrument which has been designed to handle the C major scale very, very neatly. So Johann Sebastian Bach is the name that one thinks of when we think about temperament because he famously decided to write a series of pieces, preludes and fugues, for all of the keys as an example that it was possible to play music that sounded good in every key. What sort of temperament did he use to be able to do this? So the well-tempered clavier is is written for an instrument that is well-tempered, and that's not being used as an adjective. The uh, well-temperament is a variation somewhere between mean tone and equal temperament. Equal temperament will sound theoretically, exactly the same. The intervals will be exactly the same, no matter what key you're playing in. Well, temperament is a development towards this, where the compromises are spread out much more than they are in 
in uh, in mean tone temperament so that you can play in every single key a couple of them will start to sound a bit funny in places but this was a step towards the widespread adoption of equal temperament now equal temperament although it, it it's mathematically relatively straightforward when you look at it in terms of in terms of pitch so long as you can understand a logarithmic scale equal temperament seems like the the simplest one the more complicated earlier tunings were arrived at by looking at the ratios between different notes and until it was possible to measure frequency this was the simple way of doing it um, once it became possible to measure the individual frequencies of notes it was and this didn't really come about until the 19th century then it became possible to say okay so that is 443.7 hertz then it was possible to uh, look at the log tables and put together your uh, your perfectly equal tempered scale and you could you could then get used to that sound you could tune a piano to it so before it was possible to use an iPhone to get the frequency of something and tune an instrument, or even use a set of tuning forks. How did people manage to tune complicated instruments, let's say a harpsichord? Does this have something to do with harmonics? I know on a guitar, if you play harmonics on one note at the 12th fret and then the next note at the 7th fret, you can hear where they overlap. And as you turn the tuning pegs, you can hear the harmonics sort of going in and out of phase. Is it similar on a, a harpsichord or another instrument? Yeah, so it, it's very similar. And this is the method that you would use. You would have uh, your tuning fork or some other form of reference for the first note that you were going to tune. And you would tune maybe your, your A to, to that. Or if, if you have perfect pitch or you believe that you have perfect pitch, you would tune your A to your idea of what an A should be. And then you might tune the A above and below it, which is relatively straightforward and then you start to fill out the octave um, so from the a you might tune the e and the d uh, to a fifth above and a fifth below to do that you might tune them until they sounded a, like a, a perfectly pure fifth or if you were if you were aiming for equal temperament or a, a mean tone temperament then you would tune them so that they were slightly out and at the point at which they're slightly out you get this interference pattern as they fall in and out of phase and they, they start to throb or beat and those beats happen relatively slowly when you're close enough for it to be usefully right those beats happen relatively slowly and this is what piano tuners are listening for and with some experience they have a good sense of how rapid those beats need to be in order for it to be out by just the right amount for the scale to work out. I remember back in the day tuning my guitar, if I didn't have a tuning fork handy, we would use a telephone. So what, what note did the telephone give you? The, the dial tone in the US is a combination of two tones. One is 350 hertz and the other is 440. But when you hear them, you can isolate the 440 and tune your A string and then tune the other strings to that. Well, that's handy, isn't it? It is. It was very common. Doug, you must have done that too, right? I had completely forgotten about it, but now that you mention it, I have done that in the past, yeah. So today, if musicians get together, there's and, and they don't have an iPhone or electric tuner, and they don't have a tuning fork, how would they tune? Or does it not matter? Do they just choose one person who seems to have the best idea of where the A is and all tune to him? Because as we said earlier, it's more a question of getting the instruments to play together, not counting a piano where you've got a number of tunings but you know string instruments or or wind instruments it's important to understand that the piano is absolutely central to this standardization of pitch because a piano is relatively stable in pitch it is difficult to tune uh, but it will stay pretty much in tune for a long time and tuning a piano is quite a specialized activity whereas with a, a harpsichord you pretty much have to tune a harpsichord every time you use it anyway the piano is is relatively set uh, in a church the organ is relatively set to whatever the temperature is that day with a piano it's more stable and and so that drives this this standardization of pitch if you've got a bunch of people playing wind instruments or brass instruments or string instruments they all get together um, they can form a consensus on pitch it's quite likely they'll tune to 
the principal player in the ensemble. Usually a musician will have a, an electronic tuner or a tuning fork in their instrument case. Um, when an orchestra tunes, generally it will be the principal oboe who will pull out a tuning fork, listen to it, tune their instrument to it, everybody else will tune to them because the oboe can play a note everybody can hear uh, that's completely straight without vibrato. The oboe has relatively little freedom to adjust their pitch, so they wouldn't necessarily find it easy to tune a long way up or down, but it is traditional that everybody tunes to the oboe players, and as a result, if you're, if you're not pretty good at doing that, you're not going to make it very far as an oboist. <laughs> You've you've made a lot of recordings, and you've notably recorded in in very old churches which have organs. And as you said, the the pitch of the organ will vary according to the temperature, possibly the humidity. How do you work with this? Let's say you're recording an organ and a choir, and they're working together. Obviously, the choir has to sing along to the pitch of the organ. But if you're doing multiple takes, would you adjust the speed of your recording to match the pitch from one to another? Generally, the time scale on which the pitch of a large organ changes is is almost geological so um uh, i remember I, I once made a recording at king's college that involved an, an orchestra a piano a choir and and the very large organ in king's college chapel and we arrived on the morning of the recording to discover the door had been left open for much of the previous evening the whole of King's College Chapel, which is the largest private chapel in the world, had got very cold. Uh, the organ, which has many thousands of pipes and is, is bigger than my house, had gone quite considerably out of tune. And we had an organ tuner there because he was, he was tuning the piano. He was trying to tune the piano to the organ and he came to me and he said, this is, this is not going to work. It's not possible to tune this piano to that organ because... I'd have to tune it down too far. It's 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 not going to happen. And I said, well, how long will it take you to tune the organ? And he said, well, it would, to be honest, and this was this was the first week of January. He said to me, to be honest, I think it would be quicker to wait for summer. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> did you wait for summer? Uh, we did. So what we did was we recorded the the entire album. This was an expensive session. We had we had over a hundred musicians in. You know, this was a, this was a record that was going to cost over seventy thousand pounds to make. Um, we could not afford to come back later when it was warmer, so we recorded the whole album without the organ. And then uh, the the music director went into the chapel and checked the organ every week as the weather warmed up, until the organ was at the pitch at which we'd recorded the rest of the album. And then we came back with all 50 microphones that had been used for the recording and set them all out in the same places that, that, that they were in. They'd all been measured very carefully so we could recreate the entire session without the choir and the orchestra. And then with a pair of headphones on listening to the album, he played the uh, entire organ part into these 50 microphones in the empty chapel. And, uh, and the two were married up together in in the studio it worked perfectly well that that reminds me of john elliott gardner's bach cantata pilgrimage in the year 2000 where he played a concert every week all around the world um would he have altered the pitch of his recordings because every every church or chapel he played in would have had an organ that would be tuned very differently and of course they would have to tune to the organ as from what you're saying how would you do something like that where you're planning a series of releases? Well, when you're recording Bach's music, you will be playing on relatively small organs, and that would certainly help. It's certainly possible to tune a chamber organ before or during a recording session, uh, whereas the sort of great cathedral organs that are used for later repertoire just have too many pipes for you to be able to tune them in in the break of a session um small organs can can be tuned it's it's unlikely i would think that those albums were adjusted to compensate for the differences in pitch of the organs though i couldn't be sure this is fascinating thank you very much andy i'm going to try and find a number of recordings and i'll link in the show notes to recordings with different types of tuning systems uh, i'll find some in mean tone in different temperaments and that way you can listen to a variety of different systems of tuning. Um, Andy, can you tell us what that album was where you recorded the organ later? I think a lot of listeners might be interested in checking that out. So that was B-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-1-
Benjamin Britten's St. Nicholas, which would have been a good seasonal recommendation three weeks ago. Um, but now just the thing to get ready for next Christmas. Benjamin Britten's St. Nicholas, recorded by Stephen Cleary and the Choir of King's College, Cambridge. If you want to hear an amazing recording uh, using mean tone temperament, quarter comma mean tone temperament, then check out the Gabrielli 1615 album uh, from the same artists. Particularly proud of that one, especially knowing quite how much of the recording time was taken up by tuning organs. <laughs> so my contribution to the show notes is I've put together a graph showing the pictures of tuning forks over the last 400 years or so. Uh, the source of this data is uh, pianotuners.org. Uh, I've put it into a graph with a link to its source, so you can check that out in the show notes. Thanks very much, Andy. Thanks, Andy. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's now time to present our next tracks. Kirk, what do you got for us? Okay, for my next track, I thought it would be useful to pick a recording of Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier, which we mentioned in this show. As I said, it is a series of preludes and fugues in all of the keys. So it starts out in C major and then C minor and then C sharp major and C sharp minor. There are two books to this and each book is a full traversal of all these keys. I'm going to pick one that I've enjoyed for a very long time. It's performed by Ralph Kirkpatrick and it's played on a clavichord. Now a clavichord is this tiny little instrument which is imagine the size of a little 66 key MIDI keyboard. It's very small, it's not loud, and the person who plays it can hear it quite well, but if you're 10 feet away, it sounds like a whisper. It's not the kind of instrument you can use in performance, but when it's well recorded, it has a wonderful tone, in particular the way you play the, the clavichord, that you can actually vary the pitch on a single note slightly as you, you press the key. And I just love the sound of this and the way it makes this music come out. Now, it is said that Bach played a lot of his keyboard music on the clavichord. It was his favorite instrument that he had at home. I'll link to book one of this. Book two doesn't sound as good. It was recorded much later, maybe 10 or 15 years later, and it sounds more like a harpsichord and less like a clavichord. But the first book is a wonderful example of both a very attractive instrument and this work of Bach's, which plays music in every key. Doug, what have you got? I'm not a huge David Bowie fan, and I, I don't really collect a lot of his music. I have a lot of his music, but I, I'm not obsessive about it or anything. But uh, this past week were the anniversaries of both his birth and his death, and to commemorate those events, Parlophone released for streaming only a demo version of David Bowie's Let's Dance. Now, as I've talked about in the past, there are a lot of songs that I really can't listen to. Let's Dance was a super monster killer hit when it came out, so it happens to be one of those songs that I am kind of tired of. But I, I wanted to listen to this. It was recorded with just him and Nile Rodgers, and from what I've read, this is the first appearance of Erdel Kilzelke, who was a bass player that did a lot of work with Bowie. They recorded this in, uh, in Switzerland as Bowie was getting ready to do songs for the Let's Dance album, and so they decided to record a couple of these demos. The Let's Dance demo is the one that's been released. It's really kind of interesting. It, it sounds very close to what eventually came out. There are no horns on it, and there's no synthesizers and things like that other than an electronic drum machine, and uh, Nile Rodgers' guitar is all there. But it's really interesting because you can hear how uh, Bowie adjusted the phrasing and the way he wanted the lyrics to go, and it's, it's so infrequent that you get a chance to look into how he prepared songs and how he composed songs. So this was kind of a treat, and I'd give it a listen if you get a chance. It's David Bowie, the Let's Dance demo, and it's my next track. This has been The Next Track, a podcast about how people listen to music today. You can find show notes and links to some of the things we talked about in this and other episodes at thenexttrack.com. There's also a contact form there you can use to send us comments. If you like the show, we hope you'll subscribe in iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And please think about giving us a review or rating. We'd appreciate that. I'm Doug Adams, and for Kirk McElhern, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you next time.